why we are here today. You know, a lot of um, a lot of these myths about Black people being biologically different are deeply rooted um, in slavery, um, in Jim Crow, and so we know that. Um, that impacts how health professionals care for people because those myths get perpetuated, unfortunately, even in our medical education. Reading from your book, the number of black physicians in this country remains stubbornly low, with only 5.4 percent of all U.S. physicians identifying as black, 2.6 percent as black men, and 2.8 percent as black women, although black people make up 13 percent of the population, there is actually a smaller percentage of black male physicians now than there was in 1940 when black men made up 2.7 percent of black physicians. You know, I'm sure that some people listening to this think, well, that's just too bad. You know, the black folks just don't have the quite the right preparation or they don't have access to the right education or, you know, or, or just not, can't just cut the mustard. And what you say in your, in your essay and in your book is that that's not true. It was like a deliberate effort to kind of cut off access to medical education. Could you just talk us through that story? So I talk about the Flexner Report, this report that was um, published in 1910. The American Medical Association, which is the oldest and largest organization of physicians and Carnegie Mellon Foundation commissioned the report and an education specialist named Abraham Flexner, he went around to assess all 155 US and Canadian medical schools to hold them against higher standards um, of the Western European medical schools or in the US Johns Hopkins, which was the gold standard. Of course, we know that black, historically black medical schools did not have the resources or wealth that predominantly white medical schools had. And so that report actually led to the closure of five out of seven of the historically black colleges in 1910, leaving behind only Howard and Meharry. There was a study that came out in 2020 that estimated if those five medical schools had remained open, they would have trained between 25 and 35,000 physicians. And we know they would probably mostly, mostly have been Black physicians because to this day, Howard and Meharry, which are historically Black colleges and universities, they still put out the largest number of Black medical students. But when I heard that number or when I read that number, I thought about, I cried, I cried. Um, it was very emotional because I thought about the tremendous loss to our communities. They could have cared for hundreds of thousands of patients. They could have mentored Black students and trainees. They probably would have been more likely to have done research around Black health. And so this decision or this report that was made in 1910 and had this devastating consequences, we're still seeing the ripple effect of that today in 2024. Which makes well, talk a little bit more about Abraham Flexner, though, because this person, Abraham Flexner, was avowedly racist. I mean, avowedly oh. racist. This is what he said about black students. He wrote that black students should be trained in hygiene rather than surgery, quoting here, and were best employed as sanitarians who could help protect white people from common diseases such as tuberculosis. Not only does the Negro himself suffer from hookworm and tuberculosis, he communicates them to his white neighbors. Oh, absolutely. He felt that <clears throat> the only reason that we should even be in medical schools is to prevent our white peers from getting sick. Um, he he didn't feel like we needed to be there. He felt that Black medical schools um, would never be able to train um, competent Black physicians. So he held racist beliefs, which is something that, you know, is really important to understand about the legacy of racism in medicine. There have been many, many um, physicians that have been revered for, for you know, this so-called wonderful work they've done like J. Marion Sims, but these are people who either, you know, held, you know, were enslavers or held very racist beliefs. And so you have to believe that that may have influenced these, these policies that they developed. I think that speaks to the fact that we need medical schools to you know, currently teach this history to our students, because otherwise they really are going to think, and we have data that shows this, they really are going to think that their Black patients are very different or their Black, you know, peers in medical school are, are literally different, don't deserve to be there, or their Black patients are just inherently unhealthy, when actually it's a result of 
practices and policies um, in the past and in the current time. So why would it be that black patients would get different care from black physicians or superior care or have superior outcomes if they're treated by black doctors? Like, why might that be? You know, physicians are just like, you know, average citizens. They are the one that, you know, they, they live life like everybody else. And so they absorb cultural messaging, you know, through media, through books, um, from their family, just like anybody else. And so to think that they would not be impacted by anti-Black messaging that is always around us would be almost silly. Like, of course, of course, they probably hold these, you know, we call them unconscious biases. I know, I think explicitly, most health professionals would say, no, I want to make sure I'm giving all my patients the best care possible. But we already have the data that shows that's not the case. I don't think that there should necessarily always be Black physicians caring for Black patients, because obviously the numbers don't work out that way. We need all physicians, regardless of their, their racial background, to be able to adequately and competently care for Black patients. But I think part of that really is starting to assess what your internal biases are. You know, we know that, for example, um, in terms of how pain is treated in Black patients, like there is data that shows that Black patients' pain is often um, um, like under under treated, um, that the perception of how in pain Black people are is much less than for white patients. We need health professionals to hold themselves accountable as well as healthcare institutions and hospitals. It does make you wonder whether some of these poor outcomes arise not just from access, but from avoidance, is that you've had negative experiences with health care providers. You think they're going to look down on you, dismiss you, or treat you poorly. You don't go. It, it, it just sort of no, makes exactly. you wonder, you know. Yeah. yeah and when we talk about this idea of unmet needs, unmet yeah. medical needs in Black communities, and, and, and those unmet needs are often a result of Black patients not feeling comfortable enough to seek care. And so when they don't seek care, uh, whatever disease process is happening actually gets worse. And I wrote about a patient in my book who, you know, he, I was in urgent care with him, an elderly black man. He was, he had COVID pneumonia. I diagnosed him with it. And I said, sir, you need to go to the emergency department. He said, no, I'm going home because I know they're not going to treat me well in the emergency department. And I, to this day, I wonder about him. I wonder how many other patients were like him that decided to go home because they didn't want to go to the emergency department because they didn't think they would receive respectful and dignified care. So what's the way forward here, Dr. Blackstock? I mean, you've pointed out so many things. I mean, what's the way forward here, in, in your opinion? So I, I have a lot of ideas about the way forward, but I do think, you know, there are things that people can do on an individual, interpersonal level, and then more on a policy level. Um, I think on, um, you know, obviously, and other things I mentioned that, you know, medical schools, making sure the curriculum tells the history and, and is, you know, an anti-racist curriculum that we create diverse, inclusive learning environments for our, our Black students and other students of color, because that's the other issue. Once they get there, they're often feeling isolated and have to deal with microaggressions. But I also think that it's the obligation of academic medical institutions, hospitals, and even, you know, local state government to really invest in the pipeline of, of Black physicians, starting from preschool, starting from kindergarten in terms of mentoring, sponsoring, even finan financial assistance. I talk about this in the Washington Post piece about being really intentional about, about addressing the lack of generational wealth in Black communities um, to ensure that we have access to these opportunities. Um, I also would love for policymakers to read this book and understand that health is in all policies. So I do think that when we look at the United States, and as you mentioned, we have some of the worst health outcomes for everyone, not just Black people, everybody. Life expectancy overall is going down, and we spend the most on health care. And so there are some basic things, like making sure that everyone has health insurance. We know that in states that have expanded Medicaid, people are healthier, people do better. When we look at housing, education, employment, there are ways that we can really make people healthier by investing in policies um, in those areas as well. Your book and your, arrives at a time when you have some individuals and groups who are very aggressively pushing back against the kind of history, hidden history that you've uncovered, and, and remedies that you recommend. 
given that you've got this very hostile political environment, even to knowing these things, I'm just curious of how you feel that that could be overcome and what would overcome that? Well, you know, I, I know we're, we're in very difficult times, like even the recent SCOTUS decision on race conscious admissions, I fear that's probably going to have a similar ripple effect as the Flexner report. Um, I think that we have to be really smart, um, innovative medical schools specifically have to think about what are their workarounds in terms of addressing like the SCOTUS decision that there are, some medical schools are saying we're just going to look at class or socioeconomic status. And I'd say in the Washington Post piece, that's not enough because that doesn't address the roots of racism. So I do think that we have to, you know, organize. I think we have to work with um, our, our policymakers and, and, and legal folks to come up with really smart ways to counteract this. But I know it's going to be um, definitely be a challenge. I'm, I, I try to stay positive, but I'm concerned. Before I let you go there, I have to ask, you know, your mom, such a pioneer. Yes. You lost her when you were only 19 years old. Um, she, she accomplished so much in her short time here on Earth. She was only 47. But if she were here today, you know, what do you think, what, what do you think she would, would tell us to do? What, what, what do you think her message would be today? Oh, wow. Um, well, one, I, I think she'd be very proud of me, <laughs> um, which is why I always, you know, obviously want from her. But, um, you know, I think that she had this vision of, you know, what's the work that we need to do on behalf of our communities. I think that she would be alongside me being a health equity advocate. I feel like this is an opportunity for me to give my mother um, a large, she always had a voice, but a, a platform, because some of these ideas, you know, you know, um, the the local health fears that she was having, um, the diabetes screening, you know, all of that is what we now call health equity. And so I think that really should be a pioneer um, in health equity and just be working to advance a lot of these efforts that we've talked about today. Dr. Uche Blackstock, thank you so much for talking with us today. Thank you, Michelle.